first presenter for this afternoon. Uh, a big hand, please, for Mr. Human Being. Human Being, you are on behalf of Human Being. Yes, on behalf of people, people everywhere. Right? Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone who's here today. Uh, I'm just really happy to be here personally. I'm really excited to be a part of this. Uh, I'd also really like to thank Dr. John and also my fellow NCEHU students for setting the EAT program up uh, and inviting us to join. Can, can we just like give them a hand here? This guy did a really, really good job. Uh, this is the for the slides. Okay, I got this. Uh, now, I, I don't come from an agricultural background. Um, my interests before joining NCA2 were centered in ecology and environmental science. Uh, I believe very strongly in sustainability. I think it's essential we understand this. It's not, not just some buzzword, but we really need to get an idea how we can practically, realistically achieve sustainability. Uh, to begin, uh, I'd like you to reflect on this quote. It is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent that survives. It is the one that is the most adaptable to change. Uh, when Darwin wrote this well over 100 years ago, I wonder if he could have predicted the challenges to survival we face in the 21st century. Uh, his words have been misinterpreted and misused at various times, but it remains a steadfast truth of nature. And this has also been an important lesson in my own life. Uh, I'd like to share with you a little bit about this. When I first came to Taiwan, I, I brought with me all the cultural preconceptions most Americans were brought up with. And I saw the cultural parallels between Taiwan and the USA. Uh, the, evidence of the, excuse me, the evidence of the proliferation of American culture in Taiwan is obvious. Taiwan emulates America in the clothes, the media, even in the food we eat. Uh, American-style restaurants like McDonald's and TGI Fridays have thrived here. And Western music, film, and television stand as highly popular forms of entertainment. Nevertheless, to practice strictly American customs in Taiwan would be a gross error. From simple things like removing your shoes in houses to complex Asian customs like tea ceremonies or these polytheistic worship and rituals, the need to adjust embedded American beliefs becomes clear. Furthermore, the very foundations of this Confucian culture present difficulties for the American visitor or resident. While our American history and culture emphasize individuality and independence, Taiwan society values the family over the individual. The United States is a multicultural mix with large Christian population. Taiwan is a largely monocultural Asian society of mostly Buddhists and Taoists. Now these are just a few examples, and I'm sure as you guys uh, spend the next few weeks exploring our island, you will no doubt witness many more things that make Taiwan unique and separate it culturally from the United States. Uh, but where some people would see challenges, I see opportunity. By enlarging my worldview and learning to respect and understand foreign ideas, I've been able to change my own perspectives for the better and, in fact, adapt to this strikingly different culture, allowing me to live a lifestyle I could never have enjoyed otherwise. I have thrived here, and I believe the lesson should be obvious. When faced with change, adaptation is essential. Uh, but sadly, with great terrible impact to our natural world, it seems modern agriculture has yet to embrace this concept. Uh, as you can see from the graphs of the past 50 years, Global agricultural development has certainly increased food production in the past half century, but this growth has not been done in any kind of ecologically sustainable manner. And while we continue to require more and more food as population continues to grow, uh, a required 35% increase in grain demands from 1997 to 2020, according to the International Food Policy Research Institute, growth in yields is actually diminishing. Rates of growth in yields averaged 3% in the 1960s and about 2% in the 70s and 80s. During the 1990s, world yield growth rates were only 1.3% per year. This trend reflects diminishing returns from modern commercial farming practices, which is, the, which is the inevitable result of decreasing soil fertility and increasing levels of soil and water contamination. Simply piling on more pesticides and fertilizers just doesn't work over the long run. Uh, furthermore, as you can see here, even now production growth is insufficient to provide for the rising population. Uh, you can see from this graph, this is food, that's the purple line. You can see the food is not keeping with the black line, which is the population. Uh, we, we don't really have time to fully explore these problems, but I'd like to spend a little, little bit of time discussing agricultural pollution uh, in order to illustrate the fallacies of the so-called green revolution. Uh, we have increased synthetic pesticide use 33-fold in the past half century. Uh, and according to David Pimental, in fact, food loss due to pests has actually increased from 31 to 37 percent from the 1940s. Uh, crop losses from insect damage has nearly doubled in that time, from 7 to 13 percent. 
as insects have grown increased resistance to pesticides, and non-specialized pesticides kill not only the pests, but also the predators. Meanwhile, even in the 1980s, the Environmental Protection Agency had already identified agriculture as the single greatest source of non-point water pollution. So pesticide and fertilizer runoff can be highly dangerous. So for example, atrazine, which is banned in the EU but pervasive in the United States, is suspected of being an estrogen disruptor and a teratogen. Yet we use millions of pounds per year, 76 million pounds in 2003 alone. And as you can see from the graph, we have extensive areas where we're applying 85 plus pounds of this stuff per square mile. Uh, truly, this agri agricultural pollution should not be underestimated. Uh, added to which, in 2008, we have 405 dead zones in our oceans, which are caused by eutrophication. In other words, decreased levels of usable oxygen in the water, resulting from increased levels of nitrogen and phosphorus. And as we all know, these are the two main macronutrients applied as fertilizers in commercial agricultural production. Is it too loud? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, so again, you can see these are the two main macronutrients applied in, in fer as fertilizers in commercial agricultural production. Uh, in other words, the runoff from commercial farms is directly causing the death of ocean life. And this trend is increasing substantially, as you can see. You can see the graph is just like going up, yeah? Uh, and these are just some of the major problems caused by non-point water pollution. We don't have time now to explore these issues more, but briefly, there are still several other serious environmental impacts from our current commercial systems of agriculture. Uh, commercial agricultural production releases greenhouse gases including methane, CO2, and nitrous oxide. Alteration of land cover leads to deforestation and desertification. Soil erosion and poisoning of land are additional problems. Irrigation itself has significant environmental impacts including water logging, increased soil salinity, reduced downstream river discharge, increased groundwater recharge, stagnant water tables, and more. Uh, so basically, we have a situation today where, where today's conventional commercial agriculture is neither sufficient to provide food in the future, nor ecologically sustainable. In fact, it's highly destructive to the natural environment. Uh, these pollution problems are both numerous and extremely serious. So the question should be on the minds of every, every agriculturalist, in fact, every person on the planet, how do we solve these problems? Uh, clearly, we need, to be pri we need to prioritize restoring our natural ecosystems. After all, no matter how much food we make or how we make it, ultimately, without some kind of curbing of population explosion, at some point we will not have sufficient resources. Population problems exist not simply because of food production and cannot simply be solved by increasing the amount of available food. Uh, I don't want to go into that. Instead, let's keep the focus on ecology. Remember, we only exist because of nature. So no matter how much food we can produce, continued environmental disruption will prove fatal in any case because we'll destroy our habitats. Uh, so our primary concern has to be developing agriculture, which is environmentally sustainable. Uh, and just in case you, you aren't clear what this means, I've got a definition from the American Society of Agronomy. Uh, a sustainable agriculture is one that, over the long term, enhances environmental quality and the resource base on which agriculture depends, provides for basic human and fiber needs, is economically viable, and enhances the quality of life for farmers and society as a whole. Now, in fact, contained within this definition is everything needed to provide for people, and actually there's no reason we can't do this. I'm even going to tell you how. But part of our adapting our thinking must be to recognize the primary essential resource for living is nature itself, and therefore nature should be our primary area of concern. But there's some really good news. Not in 50 years, like the projections we heard yesterday for Taiwan, or even in 20 years, but right now, we can develop agricultural systems which meet our goal of environmental sustainability. So uh, this is a picture of Jordan, and uh, I don't know what you, what you guys know about Jordan. Jordan is a highly arid climate, which would normally make growing plentiful food resources difficult. But that's pretty cool. Huh? Uh, what we're looking at here is an example of permaculture. Permaculture is one of the best solutions we have. It, it, it follows what's called the ecosystem approach. In other words, production of food, which accounts for the entire ecosystem, rather than a single element of production, such as yield. It may seem shocking, but in fact, this entire garden is not depleting natural resources, is not produced with any inorganic fertilizers or pesticides, and does not use any kind of unsustainable irrigation practices. So you're probably wondering how it works. 